I used to think that living on a military base protected me from most of the dangers out there, but recent events have proven me wrong. My name is Seaman Carter of the United States Navy, and I'm writing this to warn other sailors and military personnel to be on the lookout. It had been a couple of months since I graduated from boot camp and had settled nicely into my outlook at A school. I was certainly enjoying access to the things that were forbidden to us during boot camp. Long showers, the freedom to wear civilian clothes, being able to go off base with friends during liberty, to sleep in on weekends, and best of all, to have possession of my phone once more, dear, dear phone. Things were looking up for me. No more bad neighborhood, no more dead-end job with a dickhead boss, no more cheating girlfriend. Now I had a steady paycheck, free medical and dental, three guaranteed meals a day, and free room and board. Life was good, at least until I stood my first watch duty at Slate Tower. It was a cold, bitter winter night, and the sun was already setting at 1600. Night was falling on the base, and it was my watch. I shaved and got dressed and made it out to the quarterdeck where I needed to sign the watch bill. I looked through the postings, hoping that I wouldn't see my name listed, but of course I did. I was watched from midnight until four at Slate Tower, the rover. I winced in distaste and signed the watch bill. Slate Tower was something of a mystery, and I'd heard the rumors too, but never been able to find out if any of them were true. The most popular story was that some master chief had hanged himself in the tower and that it had somehow been covered up, but no one really knew where, when, or why, or by whose orders. I had just considered it silly urban legend nonsense, maybe the Navy's version of a ghost story to keep us boots in line. An hour later, after I'd spent my time clearing snow, I stumbled back to my barracks room, anxious to get a little shut-eye before my watch. A couple hours before, the shrill sound of my phone's alarm violently yanked me from sleep. It was now 2300 hours. I staggered out of my empty rack and sluggishly donned my uniform. I shuffled out onto the quarterdeck and into the frigid open air. The welcome chill wind howled off the water, slicing through my issued navy clothes and setting my teeth to chattering. It was like a thousand other nights before, bracing wind in your face, waking you up and preparing you for watch standing. It was a few minutes later that I reached the front of the building, the largest building on the base, and the one that commanded the most respect. It was thirteen stories tall and rose well above the surrounding area, providing a precarious view of the base from the top. The building was also quite old, and I was surprised it had withstood the many previous harsh winters as well as it had. Being that it was slated for some upgrades and repair, but apparently the funding hadn't been provided. I don't believe there was even any personnel stationed here anymore, other than a couple folks who manned the classified storage areas, if memory served. The bricks of the building were an ugly faded and dark rust color and looked chipped and corroded, ready at any moment to crumble to the ground, and the windows were so scuffed and scratched that I couldn't discern any of the dim interior of those rooms. When I stepped inside, I could see the petty officer of the deck and the rover standing around, anxious to get on their way. I walked to the rover and signed the logs and checked the previous entries. The lights of the hallway were dim, and some of them didn't work at all. I noted a couple leaks in the ceiling, but nothing too serious. I asked the rover if there was anything I needed to know about this building. He shook his head. Just make your investigation quick. This place is starting to give me the willies. And whatever you do, don't disturb the ghost of the Master Chief. He raised his hands and wiggled his fingers threateningly. Yeah, I shaved and hit my boots tonight before I came on duty, so at least he won't be able to chew my ass out for that, I said with a chuckle. I wished the rover a good night and waited until he'd left the building before the relief petty officer of the deck found his way in through the hurricane door, signed the logbook, and made his way to the security desk. I heard my steps on the steps of the staircase inside of the creaking as I took them, and the very similar hallways of each floor I passed were lined with massive portraits of admirals, generals, and other high-ranking officers of the fleet and government. They bore stone-cold expressions on their nearly demonic faces, and nearly every pair of eyes from the paintings seemed to watch me as I stumbled lethargically through the hallways. 
every footfall creaked on the wooden door below and the mouth of the musty cellar. The smell of mildew and asbestos permeated the air here, and nothing in the building showed either in the fact of the damaged paint or swollen those of the... Several of the rooms in the upper floors even out the ceiling in one place or another, and would need significant repairs and renovations, I thought. So, my patrol was not too exciting. I was making my way through all the required doors, making sure to lock and log them in order. The whole time, I could see my reflection in the windows, and I wondered if some of my shipmates, especially the newer ones, would even realize I had been there if not for the paperwork. It was storming pretty heavily outside, but other than the wind howling through the ship, it was eerily silent inside. I could hear the ship creaking and the plating shifting with the engine vibrations, and it all seemed a bit creepy to me. I was getting pretty tired. It's hard to sleep during the day, so my thoughts began wandering a little bit. I kept at it, though. Ticked off all the decks on the log sheet and had just gotten to the 13th deck when I thought, figures it would be deck 13. The 13th deck looked like all the others, just as empty and still. I was again just about to leave when something caught my weary eye. It was during my inspection of the top floor machinery room for leaks. I saw a square pattern in the wall that didn't look like it belonged right about beside me, and, out of idle interest, I sort of pushed on the center of it. The square itself seemed to be securely mounted, but with a bonus bit of thumb screwing and board exasperation, it clicked inward a few centimeters with a loud tunk from inside the mechanism. I must have jumped five inches off the ground. To my amazement, I had the square plate pushed back into a gap in the wall, revealing a dark space within. The rectangular hole looked awful legitimate when I was done, and I found myself squeaking a little bit in disbelief as I stared into the wall. I shined my flashlight inside the darkness, shining a light on a small enclosed space with some shelving with a bunch of file boxes stacked on it. I dropped my clipboard to the ground and hoisted myself bodily into the small room where my passage remained perfectly square. As there was a desk over my head, I pulled myself upright and grabbed the piece of paper I saw laying there. It was apparently a single sheet sitting on a small table. I shined my light on it and read its contents dumbly. It was written in Latin but had no classification marking that I could identify. I folded it neatly and pocketed it. The place was setting my teeth on edge and I wanted to get the hell out of here, but my curiosity was not sufficiently sated. There was another box on the shelf, so I grabbed it and rifled through the contents, hoping not to find any more prosaic instruction manuals. Unfortunately, there was more to find than I had anticipated, and my growing shock turned to revulsion as I began to thumb through the yellowed and cracked pages. The pages were filled with instructions for... I don't even know. Such lunacy it was. Summoning the spirits of the dead, invoking demons performing some sort of human sacrifice, even communication and contract with the devil himself. This was just what I could make out from that box, but there were probably hundreds of rituals detailed through the boxes upon boxes of papers. I don't know why, but I couldn't stop glaring at them, trying to understand what it was I was looking at. How could documents of such a sinister nature have been hidden here, and for how long? How had nobody else come across these before me, and where the hell did they come from? What the hell was all this? Completely overwhelmed and unable to make head or tails of the hundreds of pages of material before me, I continued to search, knowing I needed to find some further piece of information. I lifted another box and set it on the table. It was filled with a bunch of different old newspapers and magazines, and I pulled one out randomly and looked at the headline, Navy infested with red menace, Soviet spies among us. I shook my head and started to read. It was all about how a group of Navy personnel were suspected of passing information to the Russians in some covert way, and how the whole thing was discovered when some old master chief, named something or other Dale, had happened upon them in some hidden room filled with strange and exotic artifacts. I tried to take the story with a grain of salt. A lot of people were accused of being communist back in those days. I moved on to the next article, reading about a master chief committing suicide, something about the Slate Tower. 
I narrowed my eyes and read a little further. This had been the man leading the investigation. Apparently, this master chief had been the one investigating something, and the article declared his findings false, prompting the whole thing to be thrown out. The papers began to grow still colder than they had been, and my spine flashed with goosebumps and goose flesh. I don't know how I knew it, but I suddenly was sure there was somebody else in the room behind me. Some stranger threatening me with an invisible breath against my neck, and I could feel it, and the only escape back there was the heavy steel door I'd just closed. I dared not look directly behind to me to see it, kept my head down, facing the pages before me, but I knew I had to, otherwise I wouldn't believe it and I'd whip around in a panic. I took a hopeful glance anyway, and of course I didn't see anything, and then I had to look back away, and then I realized my only hope was to very quickly spin around and run past wherever the man was sitting behind me, and I tried to calm my hammering heart for just a second before I did so, and then as I opened my mouth to scream and push off the edge of the heavy table, my eyes fell back to the pages in front of me, and I realized I was okay. I was fine. I didn't have to turn around. I did not have to confront the man who was sitting there behind me, or stand there behind me because I don't think I believe he was sitting here at all. I wasn't sure how long a time it was before I realized I was shaking and that my heart hadn't drooled to a regular pace, but I also realized that I was waiting for another gust of breath on the back of my neck. But I didn't move except to slowly and gently lift my head and carefully look to right behind me so slowly to the left and up past me. And again, I found nothing there at all. Nothing but the shelves and piles of boxes and anything too far as I could see and out of the shadows, and I sighed with relief and turned back full to the front and thought it might be time to pack up these files and take the boxes back out and close up this forsaken room and tell my foreman that I couldn't chase down every poor little mystery in the world tonight. I was done. This just was not necessary. I turned back around and replaced the boxes back on the shelves, then started when I saw him. Chief Hart. He was right in front of me, his neck at an odd angle, and his head turned at an unnatural slant to the side. I followed the eyes down, but there was no manila hemp tied around his neck. His eyes were bulging and bloodshot, his face a horrible shade of purplish red. He wore the navy dress blue uniform, complete with a Master Chief Petty Officer's anchor insignia and six gold hash marks on the right sleeve. I'd seen it in all the pictures hanging in the articles and national news. I stopped cold in front of the apparition, lacking the courage to move a muscle. I felt a sudden sweat break out on my forehead, and my body trembled uncontrollably as hot and cold flashes worked through me. I'd faced the ire of some pissed-off chiefs in my day, but the unarticulated menace that Chief Hart radiated now was beyond anything I'd ever felt. There weren't any physical indications of my fear. After ten seconds or so, the figure still hadn't made any aggressive moves towards me, but the overwhelming deep torment and anguish on his face was enough to cause ice water to trickle down my spine. I couldn't stand to be in his presence any longer, but I also couldn't pull my eyes from his sorrow-stricken face. I steeled myself and ran past the Master Chief, leaping with gold metal form through the square opening and out of the machinery room. A part of me wanted to look back, but I told myself it was just my curiosity getting the better of me. Still, I turned my head once more and saw only the chief's head as it looked through the square hole in the wall. I didn't even slow as I rushed down those flights of stairs leading to the quarterdeck, my heart pounding, my adrenaline flowing, my naked body coated slickly in sweat. Once I reached the quarterdeck, the petty officer of the deck regarded me with an odd look. You okay there, shipmate? He said. After a moment, I decided not to tell anyone what happened. I just knew that nobody would believe me, and I'd be declared insane and lose my security clearance and end up booted from the Navy. I couldn't go back to that, so I decided that I'd keep it to myself. Nothing, I said, just a little out of breath from climbing all these stairs. Everything normal? he asked. I nodded, still gasping, and realized that I had three more rounds to complete before my shift would be over. Three more hours alone, with the Master Chief, and if I can think rationally, it was just an overly realistic painting in the dark. 
Taking a look at my watch, it was 0105. I'll need to make this round quick, and was on my way. I ran up the steps and hurried along the corridors, marking off the items in my security log and not wasting time with anything else. I didn't dawdle on my way and ignored the disdainful glares of the admirals in the paintings and made sure not to look behind me to the windows and see the Master Chief standing there. The first twelve decks went brushed by with no problems, but then I was faced with the thirteenth. When I stepped out onto the thirteenth deck, I felt the air thin a bit, and for a moment I almost thought it was being sucked out of the room. There was something odd about everything that I'd seen so far, about the thirteenth deck, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. It all looked like it should, like the other decks, but for some reason, it just seemed... wrong. I shelved it as nothing but the imagination of an overactive mind and continued my journey through the building, visiting the necessary fire suppressant control areas and checking out the machinery spaces. When I was almost within ten feet of the machinery room, my feet halted, as if rooted in place. I dared not take my eyes off the open door and that dark, gaping maw only a few feet away. Every part of me was telling me to avoid that room, but if my duties included checking it, what else could I do? Was I going to ignore my responsibilities just because I was a little scared? What if Master Chief was in there, just waiting for someone to check on him? With a forceful mental shake, I forced myself to take a step closer to the machinery room door. My feet thudded heavily on the plank flooring, and I was disoriented as if I carried a great load upon my shoulders, moving in slow motion and with labored breathing. My muscles ached and my stomach knotted painfully, but after what seemed like hours, I was standing in front of the open machinery room. My cold, clammy hand grabbed the doorknob, and the chill caused goosebumps to form on my skin and a shudder to run down my spine. Holy shit, that caught me off guard. I couldn't ever remember feeling the doorknob like that. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination or the fact that I was so afraid, but I didn't really know. With a deep breath, I threw the door open and looked quickly to the right, where the square sprayed sheet metal promised a view into the master bedroom. That was one of the last times I saw Master Chief, wasn't it? No evidence of water leakage beyond the panel would present itself. And, yeah, I don't remember ever putting J.B. Weld on that goddamn wall. Something hesitated in my mind, and I wondered about it briefly before deciding I may have just not been paying much attention to my tasks at the time. In less than a heartbeat, I was already scurrying back into the hallway and carrying my ass out the front door. I thought about it as I went back down to the rooms below. How had the square piece gotten switched in? I was pretty sure I knew, but what would have happened if I had gone back into the secret room and looked for the rest of it? Would the Master Chief have shown up again? I was glad I didn't find out. The rest of my night passed without much event. I didn't see the Master Chief again, and I didn't notice anything else that was out of the ordinary or aroused my suspicions. At 03.30, I returned to my room in the barracks and attempted to get some sleep. However, after the incident that night, I found I wasn't able to more than close my eyes. I was awake all night, laid in my bunk, thinking over it in my head. Why had the Master Chief been approaching me? Was he planning on getting revenge for something? I decided it was best not to know. It was none of my business, and I was going to pretend I didn't see anything wrong. Or at least, that's what I had told myself. It had been several weeks since my encounter with the Master Chief, and the memory was beginning to fade to the back of my mind until I found the toe cap of my boots. When I pulled my laundry from the dryer and the paper it had been wrapped around dropped to the floor, I bent and picked it up, examining it curiously. It was the page the Master Chief had sent to me from that hidden room. I had nearly forgotten about it. I guess it raised my curiosity enough to decide if the footlocker wasn't haunted by the likes of the typing bastard, I could at least take the time to read it in the privacy and comfort of my room. I pulled out my laptop and started entering the words from the page into Google Translate. This is the best rough translation I was able to get. Our Father who art in hell, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in hell. 
we offer this sacrifice to you in tribute of your righteous cause. Forgive us our shortcomings against you and allow us to share in the spoils of your power. We reject the Holy One and his lies. In your favor, we will rise above our enemies. A chill ran through me as I read the words. I didn't understand. What was going on? What had happened in there? How had this weird stuff ended up here at this military base? I just didn't know. I needed to start facing this bull head on and figuring out what the hell this was. The first thing I needed to do was to speak with the base's chaplain. Anything I said to him was completely confidential. The chaplain turned to me. How may I assist you today, my friend? I told him about the hidden room, the strange paperwork in the boxes, the Master Chief's surprise visit, and the Latin document I discovered there. He kept his expression neutral and locked his eyes on me as I spoke. When I finished, he simply nodded. Look, shipmate, it's an old building and not in the best of shape. You're just getting to it, worrying too much about it. I'm sure that paper was just some leftover Halloween nonsense, and that room was just some forgotten storage closet. You've probably been reading too much into it. Forget about it and don't worry yourself. I just stared at the chaplain with my mouth agape in shock. What he was essentially telling me was that I was delusional and that all that I had uncovered was meaningless. I don't even know what to say. I stood from my chair and left his office. Wait a minute. Is there anything else you want to tell me, B? Before the master at arms could finish his sentence, I had slammed the door in his face. Looking back, it probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but I was just so pissed. Things hadn't gotten any better for me since my little chat with the chaplain. In fact, a week later, they got a hell of a lot worse. During a random space inspection, the bastard found a bag of weed sitting on my desk. I have no fucking idea where it came from, but I was being set up, no question about it. I wasn't at all surprised when I was hauled before the captain's mast soon after that. I was in my class A's, standing at parade rest before the captain in his office. The XO and CMC were flanking him. A row of chiefs looked on with various degrees of distaste from my sides, and I felt like a single fish surrounded by a lot of sharks. The CO began speaking. Carter, this meeting is for the purpose of talking with you about your inappropriate actions and behavior while stationed here, the officer said. You see, this is the part where I tell you what articles of the Uniform Code of Military Justice you are accused of violating, he added, before passing the conversation to the Command Master Chief. Shipmate, what you... He choked on his words. Was an affront, he continued to rail. I couldn't tell you how many people in the space of that room berated and upbraided me, but I didn't listen to a one of them. Out of nowhere, the captain said, Shipmate, have you anything to say in your defense? My brain came to attention, and I started explaining all, logically and reasonably and with good points, I thought. But none of them seemed to make any impression on the captain, and he pronounced my sentence. Carter, you're guilty of Uniform Code of Military Justice violations and will be dishonorably discharged from the Navy. I couldn't figure out how my life had gone this way. It didn't seem like I had done anything wrong. I had kept my nose to my studies, stayed out of trouble, and tried to be a good part of the Navy. I couldn't understand why anyone would have any reason to be angry at me or want to frame me for something like this. I didn't deserve any of this. I couldn't even think about going back to my life before the Navy. I had no life but the Navy. And to cap it all off, I had fucking duty today, too. That night, I drifted into my bunk and fell into a deep sleep trying to push the events of the day out of my mind. I had a dream, or at least I think it was a dream, and this one was as real and vivid as you please. I dreamed I was watching from the shadows as a handful of men, four or five, all dressed in black cloaks with hoods up, stood in a small room illuminated only by the light of some candles. They were in a circle around a small table where a taller man stood, a noose drawn tight about his neck. It was the Master Chief. Please, please, you don't have to do this. I promise I won't tell anyone, he begged. One of them said from the group, Yeah, well, make sure you ain't. Never it is. You will not accomplish this, 
Someone will discover you and expose your actions to the world, shouted the Master Chief. The voice said, You foolish man, you could have so easily avoided this if you just kept your nose out of it. Then all the figures in the hood started speaking, but it was a jumbled blur, and I couldn't hear what they were saying. The Master Chief was now screaming at the top of his voice. Help! Someone help, please! I'm stuck in here! It is not needful that you scream, said another voice. There were several in the room now, more robed figures. The last man in command was still bellowing at the top of his lungs, calling desperately for assistance that was not coming. The men in the robes all grabbed the edges of the table and dragged it out from under him, and he hung there, struggling and gasping for purchase, face locked in that rictus grimace of empty horror. Of the fish. Of my father. I tried to turn away, again, but the dream wouldn't let me go. Who the hell was dreaming this stuff up? Then, a very junior sailor, a kid, burst into the room and gasped aloud as he took in the scene before his horrified eyes. The robed figures turned to look at him. It appears we have a bonus sacrificial candidate this evening, one of them said. I awoke with a start at the loud banging on my door and crawled out of the bed to go to it. Turning the latch, I pulled the door inward and was face to face with the rover from the barracks building. That you do, he agreed. I grumbled, what and where? You're on midnight watch, and I need you to patrol around Slate Tower. That caught my head's attention. I closed the door to the rover and started pulling on my clothes. It was time to show you what was behind the room on the 13th deck. The Master Chief had been afraid that I could, and needed me to continue what he'd been doing, to expose these lying bastards and put them away. I came up with a plan, although it was a risky one. Today, I'd personally go into the building and take pictures of the room where the stash was. No one was able to bring a phone into the building, so I needed to be very careful not to be seen. I placed it in my pocket and went back inside and raced down the steps and back out into the frigid embrace of the winter night. When I arrived at the Slate Tower, I halted a moment and raised my eyes to its high spire. I will complete your task, Master Chief, I said quietly and ran forward into the building, signing in for my watch as quickly as possible and sprinting my way up through the decks in order to reach the top deck. I ignored the Admiral's portraits hanging upon the walls and the quick ghostly visages of myself in the windows. At last, I reached the machinery room on the 13th deck and opened the door, ducking through the opening and into the room unhesitatingly. When I turned around, I was shocked to see that the square hole in the wall was already open. I must not have been the only one to discover it. I took a step nearer and peered through. It was empty darkness. Shrugging, I climbed through and dropped to the other side, flashlight flicking on in my right hand, nearly dropping it when I saw them in front of me, the black-robed figures from my dream, their faces hidden within the shadows of their hoods. A single dark laugh from the empty air. We were expecting you. Why do you think they posted you to watch over this place? Came another voice. I felt a rush of anger and frustration. I'd been played, and I didn't even know it. So, it is true what the papers are saying. You are selling our secrets to the communists, I said. The men looked at each other and chuckled. That's what they said, at least. We had to get rid of Master Chief before the public found out who we were, one of them said. So you hung him and staged it to look like a suicide, I said. The ones that came before, before us, they used him as a sacrifice to grant power. But it was more. I just looked at them for a long moment, confused. What do you mean? I asked, not understanding. They sighed. Have you ever prayed for your favorite sports team to be victorious, to defeat their opposition? I nodded. Still, it is foolish and ineffective, shouted a voice. God does not take sides. He does not involve himself in the affairs of men. His opposite, though, is always willing to lend a hand for the right price. I was lost. How does that matter? Then why do you think our navy is one of the most powerful forces in the world? One of the other men asked. Because we are advanced technologically, 
I said. They shook their heads sadly. That's because we give the greatest offerings to Satan. I had to laugh. You've got to be shitting me. Think about how we managed to win so many wars when the odds were stacked so highly against us. Think about it. My heart dropped. Was it possible? Was all the history I had ever been taught a lie? Sometimes Satan requires animals be slaughtered. Sometimes he needs only certain actions taken. And sometimes... There was a long pause. He requires a human life. I had to agree. This was some fucked up shit. A bunch of wackos. We have selected you as the... Sacrifice. You are not missed yet, as you are supposed to be getting out of here soon anyway. I bawled my fists. How the hell do you know this? I yelled. The figures within the robes pulled their hoods back, and I gasped. Before me stood the captain, an executive officer, the command master chief, and the chaplain. Who else? Who else is in your group? I demanded. More than you know, in every branch of the service, not many, but just enough, in the right places, the captain answered. All four of them started to move around me slowly. And then it hit me. The Master Chief had been trying to tell me all along, trying to keep me from coming to this room. That was why he'd appeared to me first, to keep me from looking too closely at all of this madness. The dream had been a warning, a warning to stay out of the room. I felt suddenly very embarrassed and very stupid. What was I doing? I should have just minded my own damn business and stayed out of here. It was then that I remembered that I had my phone in my possession, and I pulled it from my pocket and activated the camera function, raising it to the four figures. Say cheese, motherfuckers. I clicked the button on my phone, and the flash momentarily blinded them. Command Master Chief was still shouting, You can't bring a phone into a secure building. Well... You can't very well be offering people to the damn devil either, I said. At that, all four of them were rushing at me, and I jumped through the breach in the wall before they could reach me. I was almost clear of it when one of them managed to grab my ankle, and I kicked wildly with my other foot, kicking him hard enough to make him cry out and let go. I hit the ground, but was up and running again in an instant, out of the machinery room and into the main corridor. Just as I was about to get away, one of them called, Wait! And I spun around. What the hell do you want? I shouted. We'll let you stay in the service and we'll drop charges against you if you promise not to publish those pictures of us in this room. I'll see you all in hell, you bastards. I spun to go, but then the captain's voice thundered in Latin and suddenly it was the ghost of Master Chief Hart himself grabbing me by the throat. I thought you were supposed to be on my side. I screamed, feeling the life being choked from me by the Master Chief. I glanced over my shoulder and saw the captain directing the Master Chief, hands awkwardly jutting out of the wall panel. My vision began to swim and darken along the edges as I tried to break free from the Chief's grip. Suddenly remembering I still held the flashlight, I thought of how I might use it against the captain. If I could strike him, perhaps I could distract him, gain some momentary respite. It was a long shot and difficult to aim a one-handed throw from where I was, in a headlock and being choked. But it was my only shot. I drew my arm back, said a prayer, and flung the flashlight with all my might. I don't know if I hit the captain with my shot, but I must have, because the spurt of the Master Chief was no longer keeping me from moving. I'm not a very religious person, but I think that God might have been with me that night. The room swam with dizziness and nearly blacked out, but fear kept me moving forward. I staggered to my feet and ran out of the machinery room and onto the quarterdeck, where I pulled the fire alarm. The petty officer of the deck looked at me in shock. What the hell is going on? He demanded. No time. Call the emergency services and get everyone out of the building now, I said urgently, heading for the door and bursting outside. Up on the upper floor, I could make out the figures of the captain, XO, CMAA and Chaplin, looking down over the ledge at me, appearing ghostly and insubstantial through the heavily tinted glass. I saw that there was smoke spilling out from the area on every floor of the building and knew there was a fire inside of it, but I have no idea of how it started that day. Or maybe I do. The petty officer of the deck burst from the building, shouting, 
I've never seen so much excitement on watch in my life. A few moments later, the base fire department pulled up to the building. By then, flames were licking at the building, and thick black smoke poured from the building, blanketing the base in the darkness of night. The rest of the evening was a blur of activity. I had to be debriefed by the fire department, the officer of the deck, OOD, and the command duty officer, CDO. I needed to keep my story succinct, logical, and most importantly, credible for all of them. After I talked to everyone that needed to debrief me on what I had witnessed, I headed back to my quarters and passed out. I slept like a stone the short while I had before morning muster. I haven't had any trouble from them since all this, and they've dropped all charges against me. They'll regret it. The tower was shut down, and the remaining records moved to another location after the fire, and somehow the captain managed to get his group out of there before anyone found out. I have no idea if they were actually worshipping the devil in order to get a leg up or what, but I feel like I need to tell someone to keep other people like them from causing any more problems. I couldn't get a good picture, but they don't know it wasn't clear. I just finished up at my A school, and I'm due to deploy soon. I want to tell my brothers and sisters in arms to keep your head on a swivel, watch your chain of command. If something seems off, take it upon yourself to investigate it further, ask questions, but be warned, if you do all this, you might just get more than you were looking for.